company that you speak to talks about rising raw material costs, price increases to compensate, and it feels like walking around, you see prices up everywhere. How would you categorize the breadth of current inflation pressures? You know, I love this question because uh, I'm hearing in my district here in the middle of the U.S. and, and also across the country uh, exactly this. Uh, everyone is talking about their businesses and they're talking about how the input costs are up pretty much across the board, uh, raw materials, uh, uh, intermediate goods, and labor costs uh, all up for all of these companies. But then they're also saying that they have a lot of pricing power and that they're going to make up for the increased uh, input costs by raising their prices. So I've become concerned about that in the last six to eight months that this is a inflationary dynamic that is, is feeding into the inflation process. This is a very different attitude among business owners than what you would have seen even a year or uh, several years ago where they would have said, you know, I'm not sure if I can raise my prices because I'm not sure if I'll lose market share if I raise my prices. So uh, it's a very different attitude, I would say, today than what I've seen in a long, long time. Do you think that institutions are equipped to deal with a new paradigm of higher inflation? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, we haven't had much inflation in the U.S. over the last decade, and even before that, uh, we haven't had inflation like we're seeing today. Uh, core PCE inflation, which is the favorite inflation measure of the Open Market Committee, uh, is 3.6% uh, right now. Uh, that's the highest level. That's less food and energy. So you're already throwing out, throwing out food and energy components and you're smoothing. Uh, it's 3.6%. Uh, that's the highest it's been in 30 years. So I just don't think we have people in the economy that are used to this level uh, of inflation. With this level of inflation, are central banks being complacent? Well, I hope not. Uh, so we have a two-pronged strategy. One is that uh, we do think some of the increase in inflation will turn out to be, uh, will turn out to moderate as we get into 2022 here. So we're waiting to see more data to see if that happens. And then on the other side, I think we're hedging our bets to some degree and preparing to be somewhat more aggressive with monetary policy to keep inflation under control in case it does not moderate uh, as we go into 2022. And so we've, we've got, I think, both elements of that going on. Uh, the committee did decide to taper asset purchases uh, at our last meeting. And so we'll be running down our pace of asset purchases and we'll finish up uh, in the first half of next year. Fed Chair Jerome Powell has been very keen to stress the separation between the end of the tapering process and the beginning of rate hiking. With the information you have, when do you see it being appropriate to raise rates and what does the trajectory look like for rates moving forward once you do lift off? Well, I would very much agree with the chair that we should keep that uh, decision separate from the end of the taper. We're certainly not in any kind of uh, situation where we have to promise to do something. Um, what we can do is assess the situation next spring and see where we're at. And at that point, we can uh, make a decision about uh, raising the policy rate. Uh, based on where I think we are today, I actually have two rate increases penciled in for 2022, but that's based on the information today. Uh, could change by the time we get uh, into the first half of next year in, in either direction, really. Is the core of the committee becoming more aligned with your view that hikes are needed in 2022? Uh, I would say the committee has uh, tilted hawkish uh, during the last six months or so, and I, I think the chair has managed the debate on the uh, taper decision uh, very well. Um, we've had an open discussion, and, and people have talked about, uh, you know, the merits and demerits of, of certain uh, tapering programs, and we've come to a decision. So. 
Uh, I think that has gone smoothly. Uh, as you know, in 2013, when we did this, it did not go very smoothly. There was something called the taper tantrum. Uh, so, so far, we've avoided anything like that. And I think that's based on uh, very good communication. But the committee has tilted hawkish here. This, this is a uh, sooner taper than would have been anticipated uh, six or eight months ago, and it's a faster taper. Uh, than would have been anticipated, and uh, we're positioning to uh, be able to make a liftoff decision uh, when it's appropriate and when the data come in uh, next year. In the financial stability report published yesterday, the Fed warns about asset bubbles, but then you look at monetary policy and you are, as a committee, behaving relatively dovishly. So who has a responsibility to manage these risks that you flagged in the report? Uh, in the U.S., I would say that it's the, uh, F, the so-called FSOC, uh, which is headed by the Treasury Secretary. It's that group that's uh, uh, responsible for financial stability under the Dodd-Frank Act, and they have been active in trying to identify risks in the economy. Uh, the Fed can have some influence through monetary policy, but uh, that's a monetary policy is a blunt instrument to try to combat uh, financial excess, especially if it's specialized financial excess in certain parts of the financial markets. So you don't think that the Fed can be doing any more to uh, protect or mitigate, mitigate against the risk of asset bubbles? Well, we have a regulatory uh, function. We do regulate the largest banks as well as community banks uh, across the country, but, uh, and, and we do uh, worry about uh, financial risk for those institutions. Uh, we have stress tests, for instance, uh, especially on the largest institutions. Uh, those right now seem to be going uh, very well. Uh, so in that sense, I think we're, we do have some responsibility, but 80% uh, of financial intermediation in the U.S. is not through the banking sector. It's through the shadow banking sector, and it's that area that caused the last crisis, and to the extent there'll be financial crises in the future, it'll probably come from the non-bank uh, financial sector. Um, sir, a big decision is looming for President Biden, whether to reappoint um, Jerome Powell to another term come February. We've also got a couple more open slots at the Fed. Do you expect Powell to be reappointed by President Biden? And do you think that the, the recent performance of the Democrats in a couple of key uh, elections could influence the way Biden thinks about uh, his appointment for chair? Uh, I don't know what the White House is going to do about this appointment, uh, but I would caution your viewers that uh, on, on two dimensions, I would say on one dimension, the, the U.S. Senate is perfectly evenly divided, uh, and the Senate does have to approve this appointment. So uh, the White House has to think of a strategy that's going to garner uh, support in the U.S. Senate. Uh, so that's one factor that makes it tricky for the White House. The other factor is that no matter who's appointed, uh, the FOMC is a very large committee. It's 19 people at full strength, and it has a very strong uh, and talented staff that supports it. So I think that you'd see a lot of continuity in U.S. monetary policy no matter who comes on to the committee through this process. Hi, I'm Giovanna Bersecci and thank you for watching. You can check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more from CNBC International. Thank you for watching.